This morning's presentation is going to be a little unique from the regular Bible studies that we do where we follow a lesson. Um, what I sometimes do during one of these series of meetings is I just take a, a section of time and I share with you my personal experience of how I came to the conclusions of the things that I'm sharing with you and knowing the background uh, sometimes helps. I'm sometimes reluctant to share these things the first night or two because I might lose all credibility once you hear what the story is. But, um, you know, there's always a risk when you uh, take time like this and you spend the next 48, 50 minutes talking about yourself. That's very easy to, you know, lose focus on the real meaning of these meetings is to talk about God. And um, there's always the risk that when you tell a story, kind of like a fisherman that keeps saying, yeah, I caught a fish and it was this big. And it just keeps growing every time you tell it. It's like the little girl that wanted to make a big impression when she gave her book report in front of her class on Abraham Lincoln. And she was a young girl. She stood before the class and she said, Abraham Lincoln was born at an early age in a log cabin that he built with his own hands. <laughs> so sometimes stories can become bigger than life and, and I want to keep perspective, but uh, tell you uh, how the Lord led. I'd like to begin with a verse from the Bible. And this one is from the first book of Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you might proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And, and that would be my goal to talk about the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I really did live a life of darkness um, before I learned the truth from the Bible. Now, what I'm sharing with you is in a book, and I'm just always shocked that uh, the Lord blessed them and how well the book did. Years ago, I used to just share this story at various camp meetings, and a, a dear sister, Marilyn Tooker, a school teacher, she said, Doug, you need to write that up. I said, oh, I'm not much of a writer. And she kept after me, and she said, tell you what, you put it on tape, and I'll write it. And um, so we did that, and I edited things along the way, and she wrote this book, and, you know, just, it amazed us. The Lord has blessed. The book is still in bookstores today. It's in 10 different languages. And the only reason I share that with you is because that is a miracle of itself, because uh, she had never written a book. I had never written a book, and God has used it to bring so many people to the Lord. We just praise Him for that. It's called The Richest Cave, Man. And um, the, the theme of what I'd like to share with you this morning is very simple. Um, the world is looking for happiness, but most of the world is looking in the wrong places for happiness. People think that happiness comes from uh, fame and fortune, from having enough friends or popularity or from you know, just materialism or physical satisfaction, and those things don't bring real lasting happiness. You know what the number one selling literature is in North America? And the Bible's the best-selling book, but believe it or not, some of the most popular literature in North America is the tabloids that you find at the checkout stand in the markets. And uh, now I know you don't buy them. If you do, don't raise your hand because your perceived IQ will probably go down a few points because they sure have some really strange covers, but you do see them when you check out. Come on, how many will admit that you've looked while you're waiting in line at the store, you've looked at the headlines. Sometimes you probably snicker and gasp as you see the outrageous things they put on the cover to try and sell these magazines. Uh, I remember one that um, some of them really stood out to me. One was uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer Discovered in a Meat Freezer. <laughs> so. You know, my mother used to actually write for one of these magazines uh, called the Midnight Globe or World Weekly News, and she was doing the Hollywood Report for some of those. And, but the other reason that these kind of magazines are popular is they typically are dealing with the lives of the movie stars, the rich and the famous, and people buy them because maybe they feel like their lives are dull and they want some excitement or vicariously they want to read about these people and and they wish that maybe they were living these kind of lives a lot of people are just unhappy with their lives now I came from a very unusual set of parents 
And I'll take a moment and, and share about that. You ever heard, that's my mom and dad. You ever heard uh, the expression that opposites attract? It's strange that the irony of that and somehow how people who are so opposite uh, end up getting married. I don't know that it was ever more true than with my mother and my father. Um, my mother was Jewish. My father came from a Baptist background. Um, my mother was a Democrat. My father was a Republican. My mother was born in New York City and my father was born in a small Oklahoma town. He was a country boy. I mean, they were about as opposite uh, as you could be. And somehow, they met in Southern California. Uh, they got married. It was the uh, second marriage for both of them. And as a result, my brother and I ended up coming into the world. Uh, just a little bit about dad for a moment. Uh, he was born very poor uh, in Oklahoma. His father died when he was seven years old leaving him with uh, three younger brothers. Matter of fact, his mother was pregnant with the youngest when his father died. And that happened during the Depression in Oklahoma. Some of you have heard of a story called Grapes of Wrath. And you've heard about the Dust Bowl. I mean, he just lived through that whole thing of coming to California looking for work because there, there was such poverty during those times. So he made up his mind when he was a young boy. He was working from seven years old that he did never wanted to be poor again. And uh, he was a very driven man. He somehow got himself through uh, high school and got some lower college experience, did flight training, was very intrigued with flying. Uh, knew Amelia Earhart and Charles Lindbergh and some of those people. There was a lot of aviation happening in California back in those days. And, and uh, dad became a flight instructor. And uh, during, then the war broke out and he entered World War II and in the what we call now the, the Air Force, it was the Air Corps back then. He was there at D-Day in Europe. He was, this is a picture of dad in England uh, during World War II. After the war, um, he realized that there was a great future in aviation. And so he began to buy the World War II surplus planes. Um, you know, the U.S., after the war, they had all these planes they didn't know what to do with. They began to sell them. Hawaii, they had all these planes. And I remember Dad telling me the story of how he um, flew to Hawaii, bought a DC-3, and by himself, he flew from Hawaii back. Now, I don't know if you know how long that is in a DC-3, but it was like 24 hours of flying. And he said, you'd have to fill the plane with fuel. You have to fill the cabin with fuel, and you have to go back. He would tie off. They didn't have autopilot back then. He'd tie it off with a belt. They had no GPS navigation. They used a compass. If you miss where you're heading, you don't know where you're going to land. But he somehow, he'd fly these planes. He said it was the longest day of his life from Hawaii back. And he began a business of buying and selling and leasing aircraft until it was the largest aircraft leasing business in the world called International Air Leasing. And he made a lot of money. Um, there's a lot I could tell you about Dad, but um, he was very successful. Uh, even in the websites, they call him an aviation tycoon is where I first heard that word. He knew people like Howard Hughes, Kurt Kerkorian, and uh, a number of the famous businessmen and aviators and uh, worked mostly out of Southern California, out of the airport in Burbank, where my brother and I were eventually born. Um, here you see some magazine, George Batchelor, most influential person of the year. Of course, that's Southern Florida. George Batchelor is Miami's Mr. Aviation. He eventually moved his business from Southern California to um, Southern Florida, where he spent the last 30 years of his life. And uh, was uh, also very active. He liked racing cars, he'd water ski, flew planes, had a lot of money and um, millions of dollars. Uh, here's a picture, believe it or not, that's me in younger days with m one of my stepmothers. Uh, Dad had sports cars, Learjets. When he wanted to buy the best Learjet, he wasn't sure which one to get. So he bought three, tried them out, and then sold the other two, I think at a profit. And uh, he was just a very successful businessman, a very driven man, but he wasn't a very happy man. Married five times. And um, his first wife and baby died in a plane crash in uh, Southern California. He was supposed to be on the plane. He says if he was on the plane, it wouldn't have happened. And so he struggled with that guilt 
and then my brother and I came along. Uh, my brother was born with cystic fibrosis and dad and mom decided they probably shouldn't have any more children after that. And, uh, but here's when he was 71 years old, just uh, this is a clip from a paper in Miami. It's actually the Miami Herald. At 71, aviation pioneer George Batchelor isn't ready to descend. He runs one of Miami's most successful businesses, pilots jets, races cars, water skis, and is soon to take a bride age 29. Uh, just to give you an idea, and this was actually wife number four. Um, here's, this is a picture of him with wife number three. I know I'm doing this out of order right now. That was Betty. He was married to her for 30 years, and uh, she was Miss Kentucky, a, a nice lady. She was my stepmom, and I gave that poor lady a hard time. But dad was hard to be married to. He was a very driven man, and uh, just everything was work. I mean, he worked just regular 16-hour days, but then he would pretty much drink himself to sleep. Uh, starting at lunch, he would have his first cocktails. By the time he came home, he was almost always drunk. We were just always worried, was he in a good mood or a bad mood? And we'd run and hide if Dad came home drunk in a bad mood. Um, so it, it wasn't always a very happy home. Uh, here's a picture of my brother. This is one of the few pictures I have. This was wife number four. This is the, um, I think when he first started dating her, she was 28 or 29, I'm not sure. Uh, that's my brother Falcon. Now my brother, my dad named my brother and I after airplanes because he was in the avi aviation business. I didn't do too badly, Douglas, you know, <laughs> DC, McDonnell Douglas. The, and the reason he picked that, I was born in the Burbank Airport, uh, right by the airport, there's the St. Joseph Catholic Hospital. I was born there in the waiting room. There was a poster and it said, the only thing faster than the stork is McDonnell Douglas. And he said, he walked and he said, yeah, that's a good name, Douglas. That's what I'll name him. So that's how I got my name. <laughs> and then my brother, oh, that's not so bad. I can find my name on a keychain. But my brother's name was Falcon. And it's tough being named Falcon Bachelor. And not only that, my brother had, we were same mother and father. He had red hair brown eyes, I've got blue eyes, he had freckles, I don't, I have no hair. Otherwise we're the same height and build, but uh, Falcon really struggled because he had cystic fibrosis, which caused all kinds of health challenges for him. And uh, so uh, my dad, with all of his money, uh, happiness doesn't come from uh, the abundance of things. He had a lot of stress. At times he employed thousands of people and he was worried all the time. And, what would happen to them. He really cared about the people that worked for him. He wondered what will happen to them if I lose my work or if something happens to me. My wife, this is Karen, and uh, she, she's a physical therapist and she was trying to work some of the knots out of dad's uh, back. Um, but with money, dad knew a lot of people. He knew a number of presidents because he would make donations when they ran for office and you get to at least shake their hand and take a picture or make a phone call when you need a favor. And uh, this is my dad with Pope John Paul II. Uh, so happens, wife number four, who uh, incidentally passed away a couple of months ago. Uh, wife number four was Italian, and she worked something out, and I guess the Pope was having um, their jubilee in 2000. Dad said he would pay for the aircraft or something, and so visiting the Pope, I think it only cost him $2 million, and you can get a picture with the Pope too. <laughs> so uh, I'm just telling you how things really work. <laughs> Um, and my father was so in awe, he told me, oh, he kissed his ring. I said, Dad, I wasn't like him. <laughs> oh, I just saw so in awe when I met him, and he's there in the Vatican with all the, the, the pomp and ceremony. And you should have been there, speaking of pomp and ceremony, when my dad got married, the wife number four, um, Mary Ann was her name, and um, my family was invited, and it was really strange, because now follow me. Um, my wife, even though she looks much younger, my wife is only six years younger than me. I just, I'm high mileage, so I look a little older. <laughs> my father's wife was younger than my wife. But it gets better, listen to this. My father, when he married Mary Ann, had a brother-in-law that was 11 years old. And my father was 71 or two at the time of the wedding. 
Can you imagine that? Yeah, this is my brother-in-law. <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> Get your credit card out now. And we'll double your offer. My father's mother-in-law was younger than me. Now, I know the ladies right now are thinking, how does that work? It's true. <laughs> it was really strange. So I just want you to know this is, you'll understand my quirks now. I came from a very strange background. <laughs> we went to the wedding. It was in Miami Beach in the John Deering Museum mansion. It's a very fancy place. And uh, they had all these limousines were pulling in and an uh, army of valet parkers and people going around with their trays of hors d'oeuvres and drinks and it's just a very elegant high-class wedding helicopters were flowing, flying over the news crew out in the bay just outside of the uh, where the wedding was happening there on the dock my dad had his boat uh, he had a yacht it was called the bachelor party and uh, <laughs> the inside of the boat was also very pretty I think I might have a picture of that somewhere else later but uh, someone made the mistake they told our our 13-year-old son at the time, his name was Daniel, they said, now Daniel, when you get out there to Florida and you go to this wedding, you make sure and climb up in Mary Ann's lap and say, Grandma, tell us about the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, don't tell him that. <laughs> he didn't do that, but it, I think he did call her Grandma. It didn't go over very well. <laughs> but Jesus said, one's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. Money does not make a very good foundation for happiness. Uh, my dad had, and about the time he died, he had a mansion right on the water there in Miami Beach. Uh, it sold for millions. Um, Rolls Royce, stepmother had Ferraris. I mean, he had all the toys, airplanes, race cars, and he would drink himself to sleep every night. And so when I meet people that think, oh, if I could just make more money, I'd be happy, I thought, oh, you really think so? It doesn't work that way. Jesus said, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where thieves break through and steal and moth and rust does corrupt because these things just don't last. They don't bring happiness. And you can't take it with you. You have never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul, have you? Like Job said, naked I came into the world and naked I go. And I remember standing by my father's grave in Oklahoma. He was buried by his parents and uh, that's all you get. If you don't have Jesus, you can't take it with you. So now I'm going to switch over and talk about mom for a minute. Uh, very different. Mom was Jewish. Her maiden name was Tarshish. And um, she was born in New York City, uh, she went to California with her family when she was young. They were looking for a better life, and mom really was intrigued with wanting to be famous. She was very, in my opinion, she was very good looking. Obviously, I didn't take after my mother. But uh, she, she was very talented. She could sing. She taught herself to play the guitar, to play the piano. She just had a lot of natural ability, uh, loved to be up front. She got it from my grandfather. Do any of you remember the gong show? My grandfather was on the gong show and he won. So I have a very unusual family. Did I mention that? As a matter of fact, every member of my family has been on national news for completely different reasons. And so it wasn't uncommon to hear something happened and my family, my brother started a camp for kids with cystic fibrosis and they did a national news report about that. And uh, anyway, but just an interesting family. Uh, she started out as a songwriter and she back in, when she was still in her teens, she was writing songs for Elvis Presley. She wrote three songs for Elvis and through mom, I actually met him twice. Well, once it was at a concert, but once at a news conference. And um, Frank Sinatra, you know, as I share my testimony, I realize the younger crowd doesn't even know who I'm talking about anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, Frankie Avalon, anyone remember Andy Williams? He passed away a couple of years ago, and one of the news pictures they showed of Andy Williams, he was on the stage singing a song that mom wrote, and he allowed mom to dance, and I captured that picture off the internet, and she, it was a song called, uh, Pardon Me, Haven't We Met? And so, uh, so she was involved in Hollywood. A lot of it was songwriting. 
But uh, then beyond that, mom, um, she really became famous. She was an actress. Any of you ever see the Ten Commandments? Whenever we watch it with our kids, we say, there's mom. <laughs> she had a little part as a slave, and she goes by. You can't see her, but... So she had small parts in some big movies with Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner, because she actually did two movies with them. But um, most of it was as a film critic. She wrote plays that were on off-Broadway plays, actually. And uh, she um, became very successful. She actually was the president of the Los Angeles Film Critics. That's a very powerful position. Because when you're in that position and you give a good rating to a movie, some of you have heard of Good Morning America. Mom was the film critic on Good Morning America that gave the report. She replaced Rona Barrett. And um, had a syndicated program called Ruth Bachelor's Hollywood years ago. So now I'm going back several years ago. But during that era, it was a very powerful position. If a critic said a movie was bad, they lost a lot of money. If it was good, they could make a lot of money. And so uh, she knew a lot of powerful people and movie stars in Hollywood. Now, when I tell this story, in the past, people have said, oh, come on, Doug, you're making these things up. And so I said, well, let me get some pictures. So here's some pictures of mom with some of the different celebrities. This is mom and Dustin Hoffman. I have a lot of pictures, but I'm just taking some that you may still recognize. Uh, these are younger versions of mom with Sylvester, Sylvester Stallone, Muhammad Ali. Anyone remember George Burns? Paul McCartney. Here's mom with uh, Warren Beatty, uh, Jimmy Stewart, Bob Hope, Natalie Wood. Uh, some people thought they even looked a little alike. Uh, here she is with uh, Sally Fields, who's still acting today. Clint Eastwood, still producing. Paul Newman, Roger Moore, one of the James Bonds. So she knew these people. And when we were growing up, my brother and I, we didn't realize, you know, how famous some of these folks were, but famous composers and singers and actors were coming to and fro in our home, both in L.A., she lived in Beverly Hills, and in New York City. And, um, but one thing I noticed is they weren't very happy. Uh, we had some friends who were child actors that committed suicide. Healthy, talented, smart, good-looking, and they were so empty. Um, they were in national programs, and they killed themselves. I had one friend, he locked himself in the garage, turned on the car, and just asphyxiated himself because he was so unhappy. A lot of people in Hollywood, they're having, they have drug problems. Do I need to tell you their marriages don't last as long as the average person? Um, and so people think, oh, if I could just have money, if I could just have fame. My brother and I saw growing up, these people weren't very happy. And so I was wondering, where does happiness come from? Yeah, years later, when mom passed away, she was actually my age, she was 57, died of cancer, a uh, young lady. Karen and I were in Russia. We had to make an emergency trip home. Um, nobody called. None of the people in Hollywood who called. None of, it was just my wife and I, my grandparents that were there. And uh, she basically died alone with very little fanfare, a little obituary. It said Ruth Bachelor passed away. So it's all an illusion. It, it doesn't really mean anything. Movies and television, it just creates an illusion because you multiply an image. But they're just normal people, and they struggle. Now, I grew up mostly in New York City. I was born in, in uh, Southern California and Burbank. I uh, grew up, mom moved to New York City after she divorced dad. People were amazed the marriage lasted six years. I was three years old when they divorced. Bounced around between my grandparents, my father, and my mother. Uh, they didn't know what to do with us because dad was so driven, mom was so driven that they'd send us to summer camp um, ever since we were very young any type of boarding camp or something to get us out of the home, they sent us away because they were so busy with their careers that we just kind of felt like we were in the way. And uh, that's actually my brother and I's couple of summer camps we went to. The gentleman in the picture is one of mom's boyfriends. She actually went with that fella. He was the president of Mainstream Records. Robert Shad went with him for about 20 years. Never did marry him. Um, first military school I went to, I was five years old in Southern California called Black Fox, spelled F-O-X-E, Military Academy. Uh, some of you have maybe heard of um, Gene Wilder, um, Larry Hagman. Uh, they both went to Black Fox. The second military school I went to was New York Military Academy, and that's what this is a picture of, sometimes known as NEMA. And uh, Donald Trump graduated there. Matter of fact, he graduated just about the time I was going. He's a little older than I am. And it was the strictest school in North America. 
They had a rule for everything. But believe it or not, I was actually happier at that school than I was at some of the other schools. Um, matter of fact, I'm here with one of my friends. I, the fellow standing next to me in that little picture, I hadn't seen him. I'll just tell you his name is Bobby. I won't tell you any more than that. I hadn't seen him in 40 years. He saw one of our television programs and he called the office and said, tell Dougie to give me a call. <laughs> tell him it's Bobby. And uh, sure enough, I, I called. We got together in, in Florida and boy, he in, lived a very interesting life. He was with Ronald Reagan when he was shot. He went to uh, military school and just uh, ended up having a very interesting career. But um, I went to 14 different schools between living in Miami, California, went to school in Maine, New York City. Part of the reason is because mom and dad were changing custody. Part of the reason is because I was getting in trouble and they kept changing me from school to school. And um, I went to public school, public schools, Catholic schools, Jewish schools, military schools. I didn't complete the ninth grade and I went to 14 different schools just to give you an idea of how I bounced around and why I'm <laughs> confused at times. <laughs> and it didn't help that uh, mom and dad were, they both had problems. Dad had a drinking problem. Mom used drugs. And I remember one day when I was 13 years old that mom said, well, eventually, Doug, I know that uh, you're going to try these things. I just assume you did it at home. And so she rolled a joint and she smoked pot with me. And it became a more common occurrence for, uh, mom was so bold about it, she actually took a picture of it once. Um, very common occurrence in our home, two, three times a week, mom and I would smoke pot or hashish, eat ice cream. And she said, I just want you to do it at home. Well, you know, it didn't stay at home. And so I started getting into all kinds of trouble. And uh, I kind of bounced around from one thing to another. I ran away from home the first time when I was 13. I was just looking for purpose. I used to think about suicide all the time because many of the public schools we went to, they said there's no God. And when you die, you just um, turn back into fertilizer. There's no purpose. And I remember distinctly when I was living in New York City, I, I, I went to the edge of one of these tall apartment buildings. You know, we lived in a building that was 20 floors up. And um, get out on the roof. And I stood and I looked and I thought, you know, all I have to do is jump and I won't be unhappy anymore. Do I need to tell you that I wasn't a very happy child? I just felt like you know, my parents were busy with their careers and I, I just didn't have any peace or happiness. I believe you die and you turn back into dirt. And I thought, I got in trouble in school all the time. Why not get it over with? All I've got to do is jump and I won't be hurting anymore. Sad thing is I started thinking about that at seven years old. And I remember one of the reasons I didn't jump is I was always afraid. What if I jump and I live through it? I remember hearing about a man in New York City. He jumped nine stories and lived. And he was all mangled the rest of his life. I thought, oh, man, then, I'm, then it's worse off than before. <laughs> I remember one time I went into my mother's bedroom and she was gone. My brother now was living with my father in Southern California for his lungs because of his cystic fibrosis. I went to mom's medicine cabinet and I thought, I knew mom takes sleeping pills. I'm just going to take some pills and go to sleep. And you know, one thing, one reason I was trying to do that, I know this sounds crazy, but I thought, I want to get my parents' attention. And I thought suicide would be a way, I know this is crazy logic, but as a kid, you don't make sense. I thought suicide would be a way to get their attention. So I was in trouble at school. I went into mom's medicine cabinet and I found a bottle of pills that said Valium, take one at bedtime. And I filled my hands and I stood there a long time and I thought, oh, this is it. I can just take this, go to sleep and never wake up. No more problems. Problem was, I was, I think just 12 or 13 years old back then. I wasn't sure Valium was a sleeping pill. It didn't say sleeping pill on the bottle. It said Valium, take one at bedtime. Valium. So what if Valium is some pill for ladies or something like that? And I get, <laughs> who knows what might happen? I said, I could be really bad off if I take a bottle of my hand full of these. <laughs> and so I remember I came so close that day to killing myself, but God just kept holding it back. You know, one thing that um, helped me, I, I have an insatiable curiosity, and I thought, if I kill myself today, something really interesting is bound to happen tomorrow, and I'll miss it. <laughs> and so I was able to postpone my suicide one day at a time because of curiosity for years. Years later, 
I remember when mom turned 40, she called me up, she said, Doug, you know, I realize that my beauty and talents are fading and I'm just thinking of ending my life. And I said, Mom, let me tell you how I dealt with that. At this point, I was a Christian. I said, you lose all your options when you commit suicide. You never know it might get better tomorrow and you'll never find out if you kill yourself. So just take it one day at a time. And years later, she said, you know, that really helped me. <laughs> so um, I began to think, you know, why kill yourself by doing something boring like jumping off a building or taking a handful of pills? I heard a beer commercial and it said, you only go around once in life, get all the gusto you can. I wasn't real sure what gusto w was, but I thought, well, that sounds good to me. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to have as much fun as I can and I'll, just ha I'll kill myself having fun. And so I just began to live a very wild life with abandon. When I was living with mom, I was already using drugs at home with mom and I found out where her stash was. and, and um, Oh, one time I got stopped by the police on the street. I had a, a skin diving knife under my bell bottoms. You know, your bell bottoms back then. And um, the police brought me to my mom's door. By the way, you know who lived right upstairs from us was uh, Lloyd Bridges and his boys, Bo Bridges and Jeff Bridges in our apartment. And um, I just mentioned that because he was a, a famous for his sea hunt scuba diving. So I used to go scuba diving in Florida. I brought my diving knife to New York, put it on my bell bottom, showing off to my friends. Someone told the police. Police brought me home. They knock on the door. My mom looks through the peephole. She sees the police. She goes and throws all of her drugs down the toilet. She opens up the door and they said, we just want to bring your son back and here's his knife. We're not going to take it from him. Make sure he never takes us outside again. Oh man, I was in so much trouble. <laughs> not because the police had arrested me, <laughs> but because mom had just flushed maybe thousands of dollars worth of marijuana and hash down the toilet. <laughs> so that was the way we were living back then. And uh, so I already knew about that side. When I was living with dad, dad's specialty was alcohol. He lived on a mansion in Southern California with a butler and a maiden and uh, he had a complete bar in the house, stocked better than some city bars. And my friends and I, we would drink and I was getting into a lot of trouble. I was started getting involved in stealing and um, fighting and, and drugs. I started smoking cigarettes and uh, I was in and out of jail, ran away from home several times. My mother told my father, Doug needs to express himself because you're he's the military t school, too much restrictions, too many rules. He's rebelling now. I found a school, my mother said, where there are no rules, where he can find himself. I don't know how in the world she convinced my father to do that. So they then sent me to a school in Maine that was called Pine Hinge. This was a school for the children of, um, of um, hippies or whatever that were... There were no rules in this school. You didn't have to go to class if you didn't want to. You didn't have to wake up if you didn't want to. They had co-ed dorms. I actually found some pictures of these. I knew all these kids. Uh, they had co-ed dorms for all ages. They said, kids will learn what they want to learn. Just put them in that environment. So I went from a military school, the strictest school in North America, to the school that was the most liberal in North America, run by a bunch of hippies. And um, it's true, you do learn what you want to learn. We learned how to make beer <laughs> with malt syrup, yeast, and I won't give you the whole recipe. We learned how to make LSD, and, and we had no rules. Now, where do you think I was happier, military school or the free school? I was much happier at military school. Several kids tried to kill themselves. It was a problem all the time at this school called Pine Hinge. And so I was getting into lots of trouble. And you know what it was is I wanted attention. I wanted my friends to like me. And uh, I just, everyone wants love. And I just felt like nobody even cared about me. And so I just tried so hard to get someone to like me. I do just about anything. When I was living with dad, this is the island, just a Google picture of Sunset Island number one. That's where dad lived. He was in the north part of that picture. Had a house right there on the bay. We had three boats in the backyard. I had a yacht, ski boat, and I had a little sailboat. And the friends that I grew up with on the island, you've heard of Firestone Tires? I used to date Amy Firestone. Karen's prettier. <laughs> uh, you've heard of Hoover Vacuum Cleaners. 
Sandy Hoover was a kid that we used to play with on the island. And uh, so th these were the kids and a number of others I could name. Um, we got bored in the summertime and we would go break into the homes of the other millionaires. We'd just sit around. We'd say, what do you want to do? I don't want to do it. Let's go break into this home. And so we'd go and they, we'd dare each other. Just, you know, kids have nothing to do. And so we'd go break into home. Didn't matter what we stole. Just steal something to show you were in there. I would steal a tennis racket. I mean, just anything. And then they started daring me. They said, I dare you to break in while the people are still walking around. You could see the lights on. Because we knew the doors were open because the island had a security guard, so people were very relaxed. And um, so we'd break in and we'd steal something. And I would do just about anything my friends did. You know, it was really interesting in that particular uh, story. The, <laughs> the security guards started trying to figure out how these thieves were getting on the island because there was a gate. There was only one bridge to get on the island. It was guarded with a security guard. He stopped everybody that went on the island. And there's this rash of burglaries on the island. And we would sit there and we'd laugh as we saw these police boats patrolling the island trying to figure out how the thieves were getting on the island. And it was the kids of the millionaires breaking into each other's homes. <laughs> so what do you want to do? Let's break into your home. We broke into my home last week. You know, it's just... <laughs> it was really dumb. They would dare me to jump off uh, the bridge into the water and I would do it just, you know, just to try and get their attention. Well, things continued to progressively get worse. With the drugs, the stealing, I began to break into other homes and um, stealing cars and um, uh, run-ins with the police. I took traffic school several times before I even had a license because of the, the problems I got in. But something interesting happened. I, I finally left home when I was 15 and uh, I told dad, my stepmother said, either he goes or I go and I don't blame her. I was really a problem. Dad moved me into one of his hotels. He said, you got to live here. And that didn't work very long and finally I said, look, dad, I'm going to go. And he said, I don't know what else to do with you. I've tried everything. And I said, I'm just going to have to go figure it out by myself. And I left. And uh, I took off hitchhiking, 15 years old. I went up to Boston. And, I mean, I had been arrested several times and Dad had to get me out of jail, so he just said, I don't know what to do. I mean, so I went to Boston. I had forged my driver's license. You know, I was born in 1957. I changed my learner's permit to 52. I got a false ID that said I was older than I was. And so I, I got an apartment in Boston and um, I started breaking into homes and stealing, stealing cars, using drugs, I had a part-time job as a security guard, believe it or not. <laughs> I did, a place called Boston Intelligence. And so um, I'd guard places at night and then I'd steal during the day because it just looks like you're moving. And while I was living like this in Boston, um, getting into lots of trouble, I met a friend who was very religious and he was a security guard. And he found out about what I was doing during the day. And I said, Jerry, are you going to turn me in? He said, oh, no, Doug, I don't need to turn you in. He said, your karma is going to get you. I said, what do you mean? He said, everything you do comes back. I said, there's no God. Uh, I, was, I was pretty much an atheist, you know. And uh, my mom, Jewish background, but, you know, you can be Jewish and be an atheist. She was very passionate about her Jewish heritage, but she didn't practice the religion at all. And my father, even though he was raised Baptist, he was pretty much an agnostic. And so I said, there's no God. I stole that television. I got rid of it. Nothing happened to me. He said, you'll see. And not long after he told me that, I woke up in my apartment in Boston and the door was open. And I got my scruples together and I looked around. My TV was gone <laughs> and my radio. And I was mad. I called the police. I said, you got to track these guys down. You know, there's thieves. <laughs> so I pay taxes for you guys to do your job. And I was very indignant. And I started watching. I noticed that everything I did seemed to backfire. I'd steal something, and my friends were all thieves. They'd steal it from me. Or I would steal something, and I was often high or drunk, and I'd hide it, and I'd sober up and say, oh, where did I put that? Or I misplaced the money. Or I'd steal something, and I remember once I just risked my life. I stole this stereo. I got back, I plugged it in. It was broken. It didn't even work. And I started thinking, there must be a God. 
you know, Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And it seemed like everything he did, it was backfiring on me. What convinced me finally was a little thing. I went to someone's house. I didn't quit stealing immediately. I kind of tapered off. I went to someone's house and I stole a box of Krusty's Instant Pancake Mix. <laughs> and I know this sounds really dumb, but I did it because it was whole wheat pancake mix. <laughs> now, you've got to just think about how dumb this is. I mean, I am drinking, I am smoking, I am using drugs, but I was a hippie and I thought, I just use whole wheat pancake mix. <laughs> They had this brand new box of Krusty's Instant Pancake Mix, and this is back before they had the barcodes, and they had the little round stamp on top. They'd stamp the top with a price, a little circle, $1.19. I stole it. That day, I went back to my house, and some friends had come by while I wasn't home. I had just bought a brand new jar of Tang Instant Breakfast Drink. Anyone remember that? My friends drank the entire jar, and there by the empty jar was the lid, and the lid was stamped $1.19. And I looked at the pancake mix and I looked at the lid and I thought, crime doesn't pay. <laughs> I started thinking, there must be a God. So I began to search. And I thought, well, I need to find out what the purpose is. And so I began to go through all these different religions. I became suddenly very interested in religion. I didn't think about Christianity because I said, oh, they're all hypocrites. You know, you turn on the news and it talked about the Protestants in Ireland blowing up the Catholics and vice versa. And I said, Christians are all hypocrites. I turn on the news and the TV and I'd watch these televangelists to me, they were the lowest forms of life. Doesn't God have a cruel cool sense of humor? No, I am one. <laughs> All these shysters, these hypocrites. You know, the big problem, a lot of people turn away from Christianity because they think Christianity means following Christians. A Christian is not a follower of Christians. A Christian is a follower of Christ. So I started getting into all these Eastern religions and uh, got involved in transcendental meditation, and Buddhism, as back in the days of the Beatles, and everybody was meditating, and the Eastern religions were very intriguing in America. And so I was meditating, and I was, I got into something called the spiritual science of DNA, and I, I took a little bit of kind of the Jewish heritage and, and mixed that in, and, and of course I'd gone to Catholic school, and so I kind of made this big old potluck of all these different religions with myself as my own little pope, trying to put it all together, and I was very spiritual, and I'd, you know, I'd quote suddenly from one religion and then from another religion. And while all this is happening, I was so spiritual and so religion, religious, I'm still using drugs and drinking. I'm still a slave to my sins. It hadn't made me any better. Well, about this time, my father flew to Boston, and he made a special trip, and he said, Doug, you need to go back to school. I was showing off. I said, look, Dad, here's my uniform, and I've got my own job, and showed him my own apartment, and let me buy you dinner. I, showed, I had a wad of money from stealing, and work. I had two jobs at one time. I was a hard worker. I mean, I had two legitimate jobs plus the stealing. I worked in a rust-proofing factory where we would rust-proof the steel toes and boots. And anyway, so, and Dad said, you're wasting your life, my brother. Falcon was sick. He, he couldn't take over the family business. And I had a stepbrother from uh, uh, Dad's third wife, Betty, and he was starting to do what he could. And Dad said, you're, you're throwing your life away. You need an education. He said, Doug, I found a good school. You're going to love it. He says, you like adventure? This is a school that's on a boat. It was called the Flint School. There are two schools like this in the world back then. One they made a movie out of called White Squall. That was an all-boys school. This one was co-ed. They were boot schools, unique schools on boats, very expensive, that sail around the world and they teach from the boat. And he said, you'll water ski, you'll scuba dive, there's girls, because I told them I'm not going back to military school. Because back then, at New York Military Academy, there were no girls, now there are. I said, I'm not going back to an all-boys school. And so he said, oh, you'll love it. And so he pled with me. I said, okay. Somehow he got me a passport, flew me to... Uh, Milan, Italy, put me on this boat with a school. <clears throat> it was actually two sailboats that saved together, sailed together. It was called the Flint School. And um, after we left, I realized I'd sort of been tricked because this was a very unique school for the children of politicians and millionaires to get them out of their environments. They had a lot of kids getting mixed up with moonies and cults and drugs back then. And they got them out of the environment, it put them in a controlled environment, taught them, you know, business principles, but they taught atheism. 
No, I'm very spiritual. And they're showing films of Darwin. They're telling us to read the books of Ayn Rand. Atlas Shrugged. I don't know if you know about that. So it's sort of like your God. And, um, and I just rebelled. I wouldn't participate. And, you know, military school, you disobey. They hit you. They beat you <laughs> with a belt. Uh, they could back then. They probably can't now. But this school, these are the kids of the, you know, wealthy politicians and stuff. And so they, they wouldn't touch them. But... Um, while this was going on, I just was rebelling and I, in my school, I'd gone through a religion called Shakti, the spiritual science of DNA. And so I was trying to be at one with my DNA molecules and I was playing my recorder in my room and, and the captain said, look, you're not going to have, you have to eat on the floor if you're not going to participate. And so I'd say, fine, I'd eat on the floor. I dis disrupted the school. And they said, well, you're going to have to stay in your room. And I had my friends bringing me food, and it just, this went on for two months. I just rebelled because I felt like I was tricked because they take your passport away, and, um, you, you know, it's so controlled. You get arrested in Italy or Turkey, and you're in big trouble. And so I felt trapped. I had been an adult. I had been living on my own in Boston like a hot shot. I had been living like, a, you know, I had a false idea. Now I'm a kid again back in school, and I just thought, what in the world have I done? So... We had an interesting experience. We were sailing from northern Africa, Tunis, Africa, over to Port of Mahon, Spain. And on the way across, we encountered just a terrible storm. And uh, water was coming in, mainsail ripped, the wind was howling, um, captain was seasick, water was cold, it was Christmas time. And what do you think atheists do when they think they're going to die? They start praying, and I was doing some praying. And uh, may, you make promises. You all know what you're doing wrong when that happens. And so, um, of course, fear is the wrong reason to serve God. As soon as the storm was over, we forgot all about uh, the prayers and the promises. And I managed to convince the captain, look, I'll cooperate for the next few weeks until Christmas break if you just let me go home for Christmas break. And they were so anxious to get rid of me, he called my dad and said, you got a deal. And told Mr. Bachelor, we think Doug's shown great progress. We're going to let him come home for Christmas. Because my dad had to pay the whole year up front. They didn't care. They just want to get rid of me. So I got on the airplane in Madrid, Spain, ordered beer and got a pack of cigarettes and told them, I said, you will never see me again. And they never did. I got back to the States, went on a ski vacation with dad. When it was time to go back to school, I ran away for the last time. And I went out to a place, I went hitchhiking across the country. I've hitchhiked thousands of miles. And I went hitchhiking across the country to a place I found when I was 15, visiting my grandparents in Desert Hot Springs. In the mountains above Palm Springs, there's a very tall 10,000-foot mountain called Mount San Jacinto. Halfway up this mountain, there's a cave. There's some, several caves up there. And I said, I'm going to find God in nature. Now, on my way out, to Palm Springs, something interesting happened. I got stuck on the highway in uh, Oklahoma. I was cold, hungry, um, all these trucks were going by, and uh, I was a little hungover, and I was desperate. And I said, you know, I had to try praying. And after standing there for eight hours freezing, because I had Florida clothing on, it was December in Oklahoma, it was freezing cold. I prayed and I said, Lord, I know I've been a terrible person, um, if you're there, will you please help me? And I need help with four things. I said, please help me to get a ride to where I'm going. I had like 1,500 miles to go. I said, please help me get some food. I was hungry. Help me get some money. Lost all my money drinking and playing pool the night before. And then I prayed for a ride with someone normal. Because I was getting picked up by some very strange characters. As soon as I finished praying, the next vehicle going by stopped, picked me up, took me all the way to my destination in Palm Springs and preached to me all the way out there, <laughs> which I didn't ask for. They gave me $40 when they dropped me off. They bought my food all the way out. Everything I prayed for, God gave me. And I thought, what a coincidence. <laughs> but I had to listen to him or jump out of the car. So I listened to him and I thought, you know, Bible's a fairy tale. Now I'm going to find God through nature. So I moved up into this cave way up in these desert mountains this is a picture of Palm Springs back then, halfway up to where I lived, just to let you know. And this is the mountain. It's one of the tallest mountains in Southern California. It's 11,000 feet high. 
And I don't know how high Sandia Peak is here. 10,000, yeah, just to give you perspective. And Palm Springs is sea level, so it seems really high. And um, halfway up, just at the bottom of that hill, in the bottom of the picture, there's a cave right by a creek. And I wanted to find God through nature. So I moved into this cave, and I lived there for about a year and a half. And I just didn't want to be around people. I was so tired of the people in New York City, and I didn't get along with people. I said, I'm just going to see if I can find God through nature. I took off all my clothes, which wasn't that uncommon back then, believe it or not. I wasn't the only one. And um, I would hike down to town once or twice a week and panhandle. I put my clothes on. I forgot once, which is another story I don't have time for. <laughs> I take my food, go back home, or I would dig around in the dumpster behind the market. When my grandparents found out that I was digging in the dumpster for food, they told my father. How do you think my father felt? He worked so hard so that uh, his kids would never suffer like he did when he was young. And they said, Dougie's getting food out of the garbage can because I was too proud to ask for anything. And... Um, you know, God has paid a great price that we don't have to go to the garbage can of the world. He gave his son. But instead of going to Jesus for happiness, we think we're going to get it from the devil's dumpster. And it breaks his heart. God has paid so much and done so much so we can have real happiness, and yet we keep going back to the wrong place. Well, the miracle is when I moved into this cave, there's a picture of my cat, Stranger. He just showed up one day, lived with me, for a year and a half and I called him stranger. He kind of took care of himself. Most of the time he fed himself with mice and things. And there was a Bible that someone had left in the cave up there in the hills. And I started reading the Bible. Someone asked me, was it a Gideon Bible? Did the Gideons put it up there? <laughs> you know, they do all the hotel rooms and then they do the caves, I guess, they thought. <laughs> and no, it was some King James Version. And I finally started reading the Bible so I could argue with Christians. And, uh, you know, it, I said, this can't be true. But as I kept reading, I realized it is true. And I thought, what have I got to lose? You know, I read in the encyclopedia, it says Jesus really lived. And I thought either Jesus was crazy, or he was a liar, or he's the Lord. I think C.S. Lewis said he's either lunatic, liar, or Lord. Those are your only choices when you come to Jesus. He really lived. We know what he taught. He was either a great deceiver, and I couldn't accept that, or he was insane. I was amazed when I was reading the Bible how often I would read things in the Bible and go, oh, handwriting a wall. That's where that comes from, the Bible. Turning the other cheek. Oh, Jesus said that. Don't throw the first stone. Oh, I had no idea. Jesus said, I'd heard these things all my life. I had no idea they came from the Bible. I finally said, he didn't lie. He wasn't crazy. Maybe God did become a man to save us and that there's a purpose for our lives. So up there in the cave, I finally decided, you know, I've tried everything else. I got on my knees. I said, Lord, I'm a mess. Will you come into my heart and give me some purpose for living? And um, I was as far away from God as a person can be. I'm running around naked up in the mountains. I'm eating out of garbage cans, using drugs, smoking, lying, stealing. I mean, I was a big zero. And I said, Lord, will you give me some purpose for living? And I felt him forgive my sins. He came into my heart, and everything began to change. Not all at once, but things began to happen. One quick story before we run out of time. I, saw, I was so excited about the gospel and the changes God was making in my life. I said, Lord... I'm willing to tell people, but I'm a hermit. I don't know how that's going to happen. But if you, I feel like you're wanting me to teach and preach others about you because I was so excited. I said, you're going to have to let me know. Not long after I prayed that prayer, I called my mom in Beverly Hills. She said, Doug, you're never going to believe this, but I had lunch with someone from NBC. They want to fly up to your cave in a helicopter and interview you. Right after I prayed and said, Lord, if you want me to witness for you, you let me know. This is a picture of my mom at my cave. She flew up in a helicopter. They did a national interview. It was all over the country that day. My friends in jail said they saw it three times in one day. <laughs> and so from that time to this, God just opened doors for me to be sharing with other people. He has a plan for your life. This is a picture of, I've been back to the cave 
several times over the years. This is our son Micah when he was like seven years old. He hiked up there with me. So this is the waterfall in the pool right outside my cave. Went back up with the whole crew. That's Karen in the middle with uh, Stephen. And um, I went back one year and I actually brought another Bible and I left it in the cave just in case, kind of a little sentimental thing that I did. But um, my immediate family's all passed away. Uh, my father, my mother, I was with mom when she died. I was with my brother when he, he died. And um, I remember I was out walking with my brother one day. Falcon went to school. He got a college education. He tried to work for dad as long as his health would permit. And you can tell I'm the black sheep of the family. Uh, this was at my brother's wedding. I kind of had to come out of the cave, and you could tell. And um, I was walking with my brother one day, and he said, Doug, you're lucky. And I thought, wow. He said, you've got the house in Miami Beach on the water. You've got the boat. You've got the new cars. You've got all the things that the world wants. He said, Doug, you're lucky. He said, I'd give everything I have if I could have your lungs and live a little longer. He said, God isn't fair, my brother said. He said, I'm so smart, but I'm sick. And he said, you're so healthy, but you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, m my brother, he, he basically said, I'm, I know I'm dying. I would give everything if I could live a little longer. I wouldn't care about any of the stuff, any of the fame, if I could just live a little longer. And I never forgot when he and I had that conversation. I was at his side holding his hand, prayed with him when he died. And uh, I said, Falcon, do you want me to pray with you? He used to tease me when I prayed. I, oh, yes, yeah, you're going to pray with the food. Go ahead. Rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. He used to tease us. <laughs> he, but, you know, when he was dying, I said, Falcon, do you want me to pray? He said, yes, please. And... Um, what profit is it if you gain the whole world? If you're famous, if you've got fortune, if you don't have life, you don't have anything. My brother would give everything for a little more of this life, and yet sometimes we're reluctant to let go and let Jesus take our lives and have eternal life. He wants to give you that life, but you have to ask him. He has a plan for you. He wants to mobilize. And I'd like to pray with you before we close. John, maybe you could come sing for us. And Kelly, thank you and uh, invite you, if you've not done this before, those of you who are watching, if you've not made the decision yet to ask Jesus to take your life, then I'd like to pray with you right now that you'd make that decision. And we'll go off the air with John singing. Father in heaven, I pray that each person here will make this decision to surrender their lives to Jesus, come just as they are, and say, Lord, activate your plan for our lives. Give us the true peace and happiness that doesn't come from fame and fortune, but it comes from knowing you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. John. Take my life.